Welcome everyone uh, to the webinar. Thanks for joining. We'll just wait a second for some others to join and then we'll start. So again, thanks, thanks everyone for joining this afternoon's uh, webinar session. So I'll just run through some quick housekeeping uh, before we get started. Um, so just as a reminder for everyone, this is a listen only webinar, but we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. So please do post any questions that you may have by clicking on the Q&A panel um, in the side uh, panel um, of the screen. If you experience any uh, technical difficulties, then you can also use this uh, panel to, uh, to get some help. The session will be recorded and we will share um, all of the recordings after the webinar. We would also uh, like to ask for your feedback following the webinar, so please do uh, submit this via the SIP feedback survey that we will circulate. And you can also request your CPD cert certificate via this uh, survey as well. So now I'll hand over to my colleague, Nick Fleming, who's Associate Director for Transport and Mobility here at BSI, um, and Nick will be chairing today's webinar. Thank you, Dawn. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this Road Safety Management Conference webinar hosted by BSI. I'll be your chair for this afternoon's webinar, and we're, we're really pleased to have you with us and, and so many people attending. As you'll see, um, the, the little panel to the right of your top right of your screen, we've now got over 350 people uh, have, have joined the webinar, and we, we've had over a thousand registered. So I think that just shows the level of interest and engagement in what is both a, a complex and a, an emotive subject. Safety is at the heart of standardization. It's a cornerstone of BSI's work in standards, testing certification, ensuring that products, services and systems meet with accepted safety standards and requirements. And so it feels a, a first BSI road safety management conference is long overdue, um, both to help shine a light on the role of standards in road safety, but also to help us address some of the emerging challenges facing road safety and look at how standards might respond to those in ensuring the public is safe and, and uh, consumer protection. So the focus of today's webinar is on standards primarily and their role in supporting road traffic safety management, but we'll also be addressing some wider aspects of road safety. And in doing so, we'll be thinking about safety in a holistic sense, so very much aligned to the safe system approach and vision zero that you'll hear more about shortly and, and, and I suspect many of you are already familiar with. So this means thinking about our vehicles, our roads, our road users, our wider transport system. Uh, we'll also be thinking about some of the, the new technologies and mobility on our roads, with electric vehicles, micro mobility, self-driving technologies, and what these mean for road safety management. Um, if, we can, if we can move on the slide, please. Thank you. Um, so to help us do this, um, to do this effectively, we've we've got an expert panel with huge experience across the road safety area. And we have with us Dr. Susie Sharman from the Road Safety Foundation, Dave Conway uh, of FM Conway, Cheki Erjimbash, who is a, a colleague of mine in, in BSI's Assurance Division, Dr. Nick Reed of Reed Mobility and National Highways, and Dr. Phil Martin of TRL. So the format of today is that we'll hear from each of our speakers with a short presentation, five to 10 minutes, and then we'll break into a discussion chaired by myself, and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions and we will field your questions in the panel. And so please, as Dawn said, do send them into us using the Q&A box to the top right of the sidebar, and we'll, we'll get through as many as we can this afternoon. So we've got a lot to cram in in the next hour and a half. Before I hand to our first speaker, I just wanted to talk a little bit very briefly about BSI, our work in this space, who we are, what we do, 
and why a session on standards, why we think that's that's um, relevant now. So you can move to the next slide, please. Thanks. So for those unfamiliar with BSI, we are the UK's national standards body. We develop standards um, through our technical committees and a full consensus-based process. We represent UK economic, societal interests in the development of national standards, but also European and international standards through bodies such as SEN, Senelec, ISO and IEC. But BSI, we're a Royal Charter Company, but we're also a business with a global footprint. Um, next slide, please. And that that broader, the, the broader BSI group um, has a number of divisions that, again, are very relevant to road safety. And the one I would pull out today, and this is where we'll hear from Checky later, is the testing and certification division um, that sits within our assurance business. This looks at both the physical testing of products and certification of systems across transport. So we'll hear a bit more from Checky later. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So for those who um, are perhaps not familiar with standards or close to standards, standards really play a really important role in, in road safety and driving safety improvements. Standards are quite distinct from regulation. They are voluntary in nature, um, and but they can support compliance with the law and complement regulation. Standards are developed, as I've mentioned, through an open consensus-based process involving all stakeholders and consumers and the public are a key stakeholder for BSI. Standards also, and this is where I think there's some interesting alignment with the safe systems approach, standards can operate at different levels. And, and the examples are in the, in the diagram, really. So standards work at a component level, looking at products and discrete technologies. And the examples I would pull out would be standards for airbags, testing airbags, the ISO fix, and that, that anyone with young children would know the child restraint system. So they operate at that component level. They also operate in a, in a, in a kind of engineering context. So think about um, methodologies, design methodologies, safety methodologies. The ISO 26262 standards are very much ingrained in automotive safety engineering. We're seeing a bit of a switch there from perhaps um, focus on passive safety into more active safety and designing active safety features into vehicle methodologies. Um, moving on to the infrastructure piece. So again, standards work at different levels here both looking at the hard infrastructure if you like the physical infrastructure and design of that infrastructure also kind of street furniture and road furniture standards come in there whether it's road signage um, or um, road materials and, and um, equipment standards ev charging etc um, all the way through to um, what we might consider service or operational standards and the example i pulled out there is the bsi kite mark for vehicle repair really encouraging that standards uh, that vehicles are repaired to a minimum standard of quality before they are allowed uh, back on the roads so next slide please thanks so we we only need to look at the data on road safety to see that while, while there's been an overall decline in the number of um, fatal accidents collisions and seriously injured since the early 1980s the number of people killed or seriously injured on our road has, has not really changed very much in the last decade and in fact you know driving uh, convictions and prosecutions the data suggests that, that that's actually gone up so i think you know our speakers are much better qualified to unpack this this than i am but it certainly feels that um that, that road safety has a long way to go um, and we're interested in exploring how standards can support drive towards safe systems and vision zero. Um, we, you know, we have seen improvements and standards have played a big role in those, in particular uh, vehicle safety um, and, and you know, the, the, the passive safety features I've spoken about. But whilst you know, people inside the vehicles have perhaps been the focus of that safety drive, we need to look more broadly at obviously pedestrians and the wider system. Um, we also know that there are new risks and challenges with road safety, whether that's driver distraction and uh, increasing use of 
mobile phones over the last 15 to 20 years, um, which is a big cause of, um, uh, of many collisions, but also the makeup of our roads, our roads is changing. So we're seeing a trend towards electric vehicles, um, to connected roads and cars, to um, more uh, advanced vehicle capabilities and AI. So we're seeing the shift from ADAS type features towards more self-driving technology. And then the, the makeup of our road in terms of micro mobility and active travel. So how do we incorporate these new technologies into our roads, um, try to deliver the benefits of those technologies for society and the public without compromising road safety? So there's a big topic for today. Um, and I, I guess, you know, for BSI, what we're really looking to focus on is the role of standards in supporting Vision Zero, which again, we'll hear about a little later. Um, road safety is obviously uh, you know, an international challenge. It's a global problem. And through BSI's work with the international standards community, we're also looking at how can we influence uh, global standards around road safety to support um, you know, that wider drive for safety improvements. So, Without further ado, because I'm already two minutes behind on the agenda, um, without further ado, I'll pass over to our first um, speaker today. And our first speaker is Dr. Susie Sharman, Executive Director for the Road Safety Foundation. Susie is a leading expert on road safety and the safe system concept. The Road Safety Foundation is the UK road assessment program lead, providing coordination and leadership of the program that helps National Highways, Welsh Government, DFT and many others plan and prioritise effective safer road interventions. Before joining Road Safety Foundation, Susie was Head of International Road Safety at TRL and before that responsible uh, for overseeing the establishment of the IRAP um, programme, which many of you will know. Susie, we've asked to kind of help with setting the scene today in terms of road safety, where we are now, Vision Zero targets and, and some of the fundamentals of the safe system approach that, that we'll unpack throughout the webinar. So welcome, Susie. And, um, and uh, yeah, please, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, and it's my pleasure to speak with you all today about the road safety challenge ahead and setting the scene when it comes to Vision Zero and the safe system. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not sure if the slides are progressing for the rest of you, they're stuck for me. We, we, we can see the next slide, Susie. You may want to turn off your camera just to, if that helps. I'll turn off. Yeah, thank you. Camera off, even we've better. Got, we've got the slide now. <laughs> thank you so much. So globally around, I, I can see the slide now, yeah, thank you. Globally around 1.3 million people are killed and 50 million more are seriously injured every year. Road deaths are the leading cause of death of all causes of death for children since aged 5 to 29. Here in Great Britain, we have reached a point of stagnation, apart from obviously um, the year 2020 and 2021, which were of course unusual years for road travel. In the last decade, we've seen 1,700 to 1,800 road deaths every year. 30,000 people seriously injured. That's nearly 90 people every day on our roads killed or seriously injured. And of course, the 2022 data just released show that we're right back up there to pre-COVID levels of death. Surely vehicle technologies will make all of this good, I hear you say. Well, absolutely they will change the picture. Just like earlier technologies like airbags and stability control, technologies like automatic emergency braking, lane keep assist, intelligent speed assistance, sports assistance and others offer us a lot of hope but that's only if we can get our hands on new cars and also if the requirements of the European general vehicles safety regulation is not being adopted into UK law. There was a time of course when consensus was that automation was just around the corner 
how do we now think that, that we would be looking at 2045 to 2050 before a significant proportion of road use is automated. Moreover, nearly all of the precursor technologies that we're talking about um, really work best on roads when we as human drivers already work best. All motorways, which are our lowest risk roads, in fine weather and in daylight. Connectivity and automation will most likely come first on these kinds of roads and under these conditions as well. So we just can't wait and accumulate lots more 1,700 deaths and 30,000 serious injuries each year. We have to start implementing a safe system now. Next slide, please. Vision Zero is all about the long-term overall goal, the zero road deaths on our roads. The drive towards zero road death stems from a moral standpoint that we should not tolerate a road system with death and serious injury built in. We shouldn't just shrug our shoulders and accept that people will die on our roads. Vision Zero and the safe system go hand in hand. It's really the only way that we have a chance of delivering zero road deaths is through strategically. A safe system is one where we've effectively designed out the opportunity for crashes to result in fatal or serious injury. It, it's an act system. It's not a set of pillars, it's not an approach, it's a real thing that we can build on the road. I'm hoping to see a diagram on this slide because um, my slides aren't progressing on my screen. Oh there we go. Um, which shows a framework for delivery of a safe system with all parts of the system reinforced and based around the physical vulnerabilities of the road user. This thinking provides us with key strategies to deal with new mobility challenges in a safe system, we ensure that all road users are accommodated, whether that's in an older person, parents with kids, or a young autistic adult. The system that needs to use it for work, school, community, and dare I say it, enjoyment. Next slide, please. The safe system has one core principle at its very heart, and that is that we have a shared responsibility for implementing the system. It's not just up to the road users to make sure they're safe, it's up to those who also design, build and operate in uh, uh, that road system. Another key principle is that to err uh, is human. People have normal human processing limitations and they account for the majority of crashes. Just being human and not seeing everything and making action slips means that we will continue to make what people might call errors or mistakes, but actually reflect our perceptual, attentional processing and judgment limitations. So the system needs to reflect the fallibility of humans. The second key principle is that the human body has a limited physical ability to tolerate crash forces, particularly true as we age. So the system needs to re reflect the frailty of humans. And finally, there's the notion that all parts of the system need to be strengthened such that if one part fails, the rest of the system swoops in and prevents fatal or serious injury. Take a loss of control crash on a motorway because someone's getting sleepy. Good practice, of course, is to not drive when you would normally be asleep or after disrupted sleep. But if it's a work trip, your company might have a policy that prevents you from driving when you should be asleep normally. Maybe you might get a night in a hotel or a taxi, for example, instead. If you're still making a journey while sleepy, and let's face it, it's more common than we might all dare to admit, the first protective layer might be a driver drowsiness system in your car, if you're lucky enough to have a new car. Or lane keep assist that guides you back to your lane if you need it. If you haven't got this though, raised profile edge lines that give you that vibration feeling would likely wake you and also give you some opportunity to recovery so you can get back on track. Of course, if that doesn't work, then hopefully you'll be finding yourself coming to a nice slow stop because there's a nice clear run up zone. Or maybe you're going to be scooped up by a well specced crash barrier. This is all about having that redundancy built in to the system so that we have that Swiss cheese layering effect that means that we shouldn't end up with all of those holes lining up and resulting in a death or serious injury. Next slide, please. 
Vision Zero and the SAFE system requires to change our perspective quite dramatically. First of all, under the SAFE system, we're particularly interested in eliminating not all crashes, but we're interested in eliminating fatal and serious injury. Slight crashes and damage any crashes typically follow a different pattern to fatal or serious crashes. Roundabouts are a great example of this. Here we have much higher overall conflicts and crashes, but they are much lower in severity thanks to lower speeds and the angles of collision. So just a note of caution about using near miss or damage only data to guide decision making. When crashes are investigated by the police, they focus on attributing blame. As well as this, we should be investigating what about the system didn't protect the user? What parts of the system could be strengthened to prevent the crash from being fatal or serious in the future? And in many cases, the answer to injury causation, not crash causation, injury causation, will be infrastructure or speed related. But also vehicle technologies play a very significant role. Under a traditional approach, we'd be incrementally responding to crashes and cluster sites as they happen. Under the SAFE system, we must take a more energetic and ultimately systematic approach that proactively deals with risk. Under the SAFE system, our, our goal, of course, is to eliminate all death and serious injury rather than simply optimising uh, cash reduction. And our road infrastructure approach, therefore, needs to be systematic and strategic. It needs to be based on survivability and it needs to proactively manage risk. Next slide, please. If you're building a house, you wouldn't start off without a plan. If you did, you'd end up with bricks placed haphazardly all over the shop, a little bit like my children building Lego. You would, of course, have to have a vision of the end result and a plan to get you there. And I'm always really inspired by the progressive approach to road safety taken by the Dutch in their sustainable safety initiative. Here they have Vision Zero, as their long-term goal and they have systematically worked towards a road network that's both safe and credible for those users that are expected to be present. They have blueprints for each of their road types that they define in a functional hierarchy. They know what they're building towards and they know the layouts are safe for those who are expected to use them. Next slide please. The safe system also, and it'll be the next slide again please, Thanks. So a safe system also needs to be based on survivability, both now and in the future. Note back again. <laughs> the graphs, please. Previous slide. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the graph here is from a PhD thesis by Ramburg in 2005, where they analysed in-depth crash investigation data. It shows the impact speed along the x-axis and the fatality risk on the y-axis. And here you can see the fatality risk increases to sharp with impact speeds about 20 miles an hour for pedestrians and cyclists. And of course, this is why we're seeing a lot of 20 mile per hour speed limits coming through. And I shan't comment on the politics of all this, um, but I've just been at the Welsh um, Road Safety Conference and the um, Deputy Minister here has made a really bold decision to um, provide a default 20 mile an hour for urban situations because of this evidence we know that beyond 20 miles an hour the risk of being fatally injured goes absolutely skyrocketing and um, and when you get to 30 miles an hour many many people will be dead similarly side collisions like the ones you might get at a t-junction or crossroads become much more likely to be fatal at impact speeds above 30 and head-on fatality risk increases sharply above 45. on the right hand side of the screen is a bit of an updated version of this, but it focuses on a 10% risk of severe injury. So these are the most um, life changing serious injuries that we might expect to have. So at uh, 15 miles an hour, 10% of car to pedestrian or cyclist crashes will result in a severe injury. Side impacts, it's 40 miles an hour and head on crashes, it's 30 miles an hour. Slightly different results to the Rambog work, which may reflect the changing vehicle fleet. Um, and here, of course, we're talking about 10% risk of severe injury rather than fatal injury. So we've got slightly different things that we're getting at here. But ultimately, if we're trying to aim for zero harm, then we have to manage speed within these tolerances of injury 
and the frailty of the human body. Next slide, please. Of course, we can expect these to change and expect there to be a little bit more tolerance as vehicle systems improve. And so we need to make sure that we're looking at these survivability speeds for the future. And we can calculate those based on our best knowledge of what the systems will offer and bring to the table in the future. But this actually does change how we might tackle road layouts and configurations um, and how we plan for those um, in, in the future. We should now have the um, grey slide um, with proactive at the top. I'm not sure if you can see that on my screen. We're on survivability still. Can you progress the slides to the proactive one with the IRAP logo on? We're, we're on the proactive slide. You're on it. Sorry, I've got must have a horrible lag here. Um, so we've already seen that we need to be more strategic and systematic in planning our network, and we also need to be thinking about how um, speed, what speeds are survivable um, and making sure that we have configurations of roads that reflect this. Now let's look at the need to reduce risk in a proactive manner, which assumes that you can't immediately reconstruct all of your roads to look like the blueprints that you've already spoken about. Normally in road safety engineering, we talk about treating locations where there have been concentrations of crashes historically, black spots or hotspots or crash cluster sites. The good news is that it's quite hard to find these now. Our crashes are sparsely distributed. We don't find very many robust um, crash hotspots. So we need to take a different approach when we're talking about developing a safe system because historical crashes just aren't a great predictor of future crashes. So if we look at the route um, on the screen, you can see the red blobs are serious crashes that have happened in the past. Um, we haven't got much to go by, but the IRAP methodology actually allows us to fill in the blanks and um, understand risk as we move along the route based on known relationships between road infrastructure and, uh, and facing serious injury risk. And what we can do then is test out different solutions against these predicted modelled facing serious injuries, which allows us to build business cases for whole routes. Next slide, please. So what are the opportunities? We need to present our road safety case for Vision Zero in the context of other priorities. For example, smoother lower speeds are likely to have positive fuel consumption and emission impacts. Increasing high quality active travel facilities will help with the obesity crisis and so on. We can update design standards to take account of survivable speeds, not just focusing on design speeds. We can anticipate the benefits and disbenefits of our future vehicle fleet and ensure compatibility of vehicles and roads so that when crashes happen, they together protect human life. We can maximise the potential for vehicle systems to work where humans don't, by putting in better white lines across our road network, making sure that this includes roads where you're most likely to lose control, so on bendy single carriageway roads. We need to get better at gathering evidence through crash investigation, looking at system failures, rather than the attribution of blame on road users, following up on schemes to determine what works and what doesn't. And we need to define a functional hierarchy, a set of blueprints for our road network for the future. Measuring and actively managing road safety performance and planning investments, here we can look at what our road network would need to look like by 2040 or 2050, taking into account the contribution of vehicle technologies, and then take steps back today to today using backcasting techniques rather than just only casting out and working out what we can do with our current um, set of countermeasures, we need to work out what the road network needs to look like by our Vision Zero date and then set interim targets and metrics to track performance towards the way that the network needs to be by, um, by 2040 or 2050. Um, so that's all from me. I hope that's outlined some of the key challenges, what the safe system demands that's different from, from normal operation and um, um, we might see as an opportunity to progress things in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you, Susie. Um, yeah, fantastic um, scene setting. And as you say, you know, sobering figures on the, on the road safety data and the challenge ahead. But you know, there is potential coming from new technologies if we can unlock unlock that potential safely and effectively. And, and we wouldn't accept the same level of 
public risk in in other transport modes like aviation or rail. So I think it's quite quite a stark um, comparison. Um, I'll, I'll hand now to our next speaker, Dave Conway. Um, Dave has dedicated a large part of his career to road safety and, and to road safety standardisation. Actually, so. Dave is IMS and Road Safety Manager at FM Conway, uh, a civils contractor specialising in highways maintenance and infrastructure. Dave's also the chair of BSI's Road Traffic Safety Committee and has been involved in the development of ISO 39001 Road Traffic Safety Management Systems. In his day job, Dave has helped um, FM Conway to create a road traffic management system based on this standard 39001. So he's well placed to share his insights uh, both in terms of applying the standard in th in practice and the theory behind it. And we look forward to hearing more, Dave. Over to you. Yes, good afternoon and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and bring this to your attention, really. So, so my real challenge for you is, is what is ISO 39001? And what ISO 39001 is, is an internationally agreed standard for road traffic safety management systems. It is not a system in its own right. It's actually a framework that enables businesses to create their own management system for managing safety in respect to what they do uh, and their activities and so on. And it targets, it's entirely about targeting reduction of death and serious injury resulting from low traffic crashes. Uh, and it's basically a plan do check management system uh, process that is well known and understood through other standards such as ISO 9001 for quality management, 14001 for environmental management and so on. The requirements of the standard, and bear in mind to say this standard tells you what you need to put into your management system to achieve the requirements. The seven key areas are the context of the organisation. And by context of the organisation, we are talking about what the business does that is actually relevant to um, the road network. We're talking about leadership because at the end of the day, if we don't have leadership in the business, we're not going to achieve what we need to achieve or our objectives. And part of that leadership is indeed setting those objectives. We need to have planning and that planning gives us methodology for evaluating the risks and the impacts that we're having on the road network and what our activities are doing to the road network and the safety of the roads in general. We need to have support because you can't operate uh, something like transport in isolation from the rest of the business. You must embrace all of the people in the business, all of the activities of the business. So you need coordination, you need training, you need your communications departments and so on. Obviously, your operations. Operations are the key to actually what you do, how you do it um, and making a difference. It's important that you have performance evaluation. We must measure what we're doing, how well we're doing, because if you don't measure it, you don't know if you're succeeding or not. And then the real key is continual improvement. You need to be looking at what you're doing, what you're achieving and how you can make it better, where you're, you're having shortfalls and so on to make your system better and better each year. So what makes it different from some of the other schemes that are around? And I know in the UK, we have a number of commercial schemes. I won't mention them by name, but you know what they are. And these are commercial schemes that supposedly offer uh, freight operators in particular um, a means of uh, ensuring that they, they work safe on the roads. 39,001 is different from that. It's not a checklist scheme nor is it intended entirely for fleet operators. At the end of the day, any business will have interactions with the road network. It might be that they are a construction company like FM Conway, where we are moving men, materials, machinery to and from work sites, etc. It might be that they're a haulage company, or it might be something quite different. For example, I spend a fair amount of time working with Brighton and Hove City Council who went and got ISO 39001 to demonstrate that they as a city 
understood the, the need for safety within their packs. So that was unique. But also firms like McDonald's. And you say, well, what have McDonald's got to do with road safety? Oh, they just run a few Arctics up and down the country, move, moving food and so on. But what about their drive through operations, where they put them, how they route traffic in and out of them? Those are all um, operations that have an impact upon road safety and 39,001 for them could make a big, big difference to how they do things. So in order to put your management system together, you need to understand the needs and expectations of the stakeholders, the interested parties in your business. You need to have a methodology to evaluate how much impact your activities have on road safety. Once you've got those, those handled, you can set about having targets and objectives and meaningful timescales for improvement. You can determine those aspects that need to be monitored and measured, and you can put in a proper management system with documentation, records, control for shortcomings, et cetera, et cetera. And there's audits and reviewing and continual improvement is the absolute key. Whatever you're doing at the moment, let's do it a bit better next time. As I say, unlike some so-called road safety schemes, it's not a tick box exercise where you just say, I've done this, I've got a wheel on each corner of my lorry and it's got enough tread on it, so I must be safe. It's a lot more than that. It's a full-blown management system developed by the business for the business and delivering best value to the business. So what did we do on FM Conway to establish a system? Well, we took approach, the first thing, we need to have the right people. And by the right people, we want to make sure that those people who are driving have the right licenses and we check their qualifications. We assess our drivers. No one comes to work for Conway driving a vehicle without having a, a literally a hands-on assessment with one of our trained instructors and they go out on the road for 10 minutes or so just to check that they truly are competent. Health. Health's very important. Eyesight checks were the first thing we got really strict about. But last week's accident, uh, I think it was the M53 with a school bus where there were clearly issues with the driver of the bus. Um, but I think these really highlight the need to ensure that the people who are moving these deadly objects around our roads are physically fit enough and healthy enough to be able to do that. Training. Training goes a long way, but it doesn't go enough the way. I don't think you can just make your firm better drivers by training. You've got to move that training into a culture of safety and build some professional development around that as well to encourage people. We also made sure that the vehicles we were using were, were better uh, and entirely suitable. So we introduced a formal maintenance regime. We had maintenance before, but it was never as strict and formalized as we have it these days. Daily driver checks, now these are a requirement for lorries and so on and have been for many, many years, but we have it for all vehicles. We actually started liaising with vehicle manufacturers. And when we first wrote this system, people said to me, well, why will vehicle manufacturers listen to you? And I said, well, let's just have a go at it. What have we got to lose talking? And we've been quite surprised at some of the innovations we've been able to contribute to or, or, or see through from manufacturers and developers of road safety products that we're very proud of. And then one of the things we brought in, and bear in mind we did this back in 2012, we brought in a, a tool for assessing visibility from the vehicles. So before we purchased any vehicle, we could decide whether or not the driver could see properly from it or what cameras were needed. And this was way before London brought in its direct vision standard. And then the final key piece in the jigsaw really is being in the right place. So you've got the right person, you've got the right vehicle, but it's important to have it in the right place at the right time. So we put in some very sophisticated route planning systems that enabled us to avoid hot spots. We developed a system for safe access and egress from our work sites, which are generally roads. And we also developed a safe system for safe access and egress from our own yards and depots. What did we get for all of this? And this is, you know, at the end of the day, I've, I've done management systems for most of my working life. And the first thing I learned about management systems is that there needs to be a business case for doing it. 
So here's our business case. In the first year that we got ISO 39001, we saw a saving in our insurance premium for Motor Fleet of £56,000. That was a 10% reduction in our Motor Fleet insurance cost in year one. And that alone paid for certification to 39001 for seven years. So there's your, your cost case straight away. On top of that, we saw a 15% reduction in repair and maintenance costs, even though our actual routine maintenance cost went up by 5%. We simply found that wear and tear on the vehicles reduced so significantly as a result of drivers starting to care that you could afford the extra servicing. And of course, the other thing the extra servicing gave them was a feeling of confidence in their vehicles that made them drive better. And then the final, business benefit, cost benefit was fuel efficiency because a driver who drives safely tends to save fuel as well. And we saw an average increase in miles per gallon on our vehicles of 3.8, which was just a staggering, staggering uh, improvement. There's other benefits, societal benefits. We actually really made a difference to safety on the road network. And if we look at that graph, you can see the purple bars are the size of our fleet. The green line is the number of incidents falling from when we got it to where we are now. And the red line is the number of incidents involving injury, which has come down to almost nothing now. And I keep touching wood, uh, we target zero. There's more benefits. There's some marketing benefits because at the end of the day, most businesses want to have some in some marketability. And I'm happy to say these are just some of the awards that we have won for our approach to road safety in the past few years. Last year, we actually ran out of budget for attending events. We picked up so many awards we couldn't afford to go any, to any more ceremonies to pick up the, uh, the actual trophies. So that, that's, that's a good year and I'm expecting a good year this year as well. But a lot of this is about continual improvement. It's not just what we did. We've done a lot of stuff since we gained certification. Some of the things we've achieved are here. Uh, our you know, award-winning scheme for recognizing our driver's skills, the near-side visibility windows that we persuaded lorry manufacturers to install for us. They're not that uncommon now, but they've never done it before. And we said to them, can we add a window to enable the driver to see a cyclist beside him? And they said, well, yeah, but we won't be able to have an electric window mechanism in there anymore. Well, we figured the driver could live without having an electric near side window if he could see a, a cyclist and not kill him. Uh, we brought in technology to prevent mobile phones from working in vehicles when they're moving. And that's not as simple as you might think. That's quite a significant cost because it's not just about the technology that stops the phone from working. It also has to work with a paired phone. So we had to give every driver a phone that they could use privately as well as for work just to pair it with the system in their lorries we spent a lot of money investing in high visibility vehicles like the mercedes iconics we have introduced uh, a driver risk profiling system whereby every driver has to profile his risks it's an online um, assessment and he has to do that every year and has to do e-training based around the outcomes of that risk profiling we introduced virtual reality safer urban driving course where our, our riders could pretend they were on a bicycle and it was so engaging and so immersive that we actually had to limit it to five minutes at a time because we found it was, was too, too engaging for the drivers. And our most recent, most exciting innovation was the one that, that came in with the assistance of Brigade where all of our lorries are now installed with predictive side scanners so that they can see if a kid is coming towards them or a ball is rolling out in the road and so on to, to warn all drivers of anything in, in coming their way. Okay. And there have been other standards. So we didn't just stop at 39,001, which is the 
mothership of the standards for road safety. Since then, there has been 39,002, which offers good practices for commuting, because at the end of the day, it'd be tragic if you set it all up for work so that everyone was safe at work and then couldn't make the journey to or from. We have just this year published ISO 39003, which is guidance for the ethical behavior of autonomous vehicles. And I think we all know that autonomous vehicles give us the opportunity to greatly reduce the risks of road crashes and the outcomes of road crashes, but it'll only work as long as the vehicle itself has been trained to behave that way. And if we train our vehicles to deliberately go 10% above the speed limit because they can get away with it, then we're probably going the wrong way. And there is currently a work starting on 39,004, which is a series of good practices for the people who are doing online services. That could be Amazon delivering goods, or it could be Uber or someone delivering food or whatever. So that's going to be a new standard developed over the next three years for, for best practices for those guys. And I have been asked to let you know that anyone who attends this, this webinar today, if they use the code on screen, is entitled to a 10% discount off any of these standards. So uh, Hopefully you'll you'll be tempted to go out, get a copy, have a look and see what you can do with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Now that, that was incredibly um yeah, I think powerful um hearing what FM Conway have, have been up to in terms of the implementation of the standards. Um as you say, the, the business case and the data around that is is, is very clear. Um we, as you might expect, we've already got quite a few questions around the 39,001 standard that have come in. We'll try and pick those up later. Um, in the interest of time, and I'm doing an awful job of, of, of chairing, keeping us on time, but in the interest of time, we, we need to move on. Um, we talked a bit about the wider system approach and the context to, to road safety management. Um, now let's take a bit more of a deep dive into our transport infrastructure and how that needs to adapt to meet the demands of, of changing fleets, changing vehicles on our roads. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Cheki Erjivash, uh, a certification technical lead in BSI's Assurance Division. As mentioned earlier, standards play a key role in underpinning the testing and certification activities, uh, whether that's materials, infrastructure uh, or, or other. Um, Checky looks after BSI certification activity covering various road safety related themes including vehicle restraint systems, materials for road marking, support structure and this is obviously you know important as the vehicles on our road change and we expect to see more of that in the coming decade with electric cars and buses. Prior, prior to joining BSI, Checky worked as a principal consultant for TRL for over a decade leading roadside safety research, consulting and contributing to standards development via BSI's technical committees and working with authorities including National Highways and Transport for Scotland. So, um, Checky, over to you and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Nick. Um, let's see if I have control of these uh, slides. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, I will be talking about a little bit more specific area of road safety, which is roadside safety and uh, runoff road incidents, which are incidents where at least one vehicle leaves the carriageway. And unfortunately, these are one of the biggest contributors of casualties in our roads today. Uh, the table on the screen you can see shows the injurious accidents recorded on GB Trunk Road Network uh, in the last three years. And you can see uh, runoff road collisions uh, you know, formed around one in three accidents recorded. But if you look at the higher severity incidents, runoff road accidents were actually responsible for around 40% of the fatal and serious uh, incidents recorded. So quite quite an uh, important area. And this is where vehicle restraint systems come in, which are road safety products designed to mitigate the risks to road users and third parties. This is because impacting a vehicle restraint systems, a vehicle restraint system is expected to result in a lower severity outcome than breaching the hazard that is located behind it. So they play a very important role in a safe systems approach. Now, how do we assess the performance of a vehicle restraint system? This is done by full scale crash testing in accordance with the European standard EN 1370. Just so you understand, 
generally speaking, for a normal containment system, which is designed for uh, containing a car, we have two crash tests, a 900 kilogram impact and a one and a half ton uh, impact test. And there are also higher containment systems, which include the crash test with an HGV oil bus. But today we will be focusing on the normal containment system because these are by far the most common on our road. And uh, I have to say, EN 1317 describes the test vehicles uh, in a lot of detail. There is the vehicle mass, the uh, center of gravity location, et cetera, and the size of the vehicle. However, these uh, properties have not changed since the 1998 version of the standard, but the vehicles we see on the roads have changed massively since then. So let's uh, take a trip. Uh, let's see with some examples. These are some typical 900 kilogram car or TB11 vehicle uh, impact, uh, sorry, impact vehicles, test vehicles that are still used today in the test houses around Europe, like the Opel Corsa Gen B, Suzuki Swift second gen, etc. We can also refer to these as segment B vehicles. And you can see these range from around 850 to 780, those kind of uh, average mass. And for the TB32, one and a half ton vehicle or segment B vehicle, we are looking at examples Audi A4 or BMW 3 series, for example, or SD1 was which with which the majority of the non-proprietary systems were originally developed in this country. We're looking at around 1.2 to 1.4 tons on average. So actually in a test, the test house needs to add in extra ballast. So the weight of the vehicle goes up to one and a half tons. So you can see when the standard was developed, these uh, specifications, one and a half tons, actually represented quite a bit of factor of safety to cover a larger amount of vehicles on the road. So what happened since then? One of the biggest changes is in vehicle structure fueled by the European Frontal and Side Impact Directives and more importantly, perhaps by the Uran cap. Because uh, as you can see on the picture below, on the left, you see that uh, Opel Corsa Gen B example, one of the earliest NCAP tests ever done. Look at the amount of damage absorbed by the deformation of the vehicle. Look at one of the uh, modern counterparts of the same vehicle, completely different uh, structural stiffness. This is uh, achieved by a increase in in the quality of steels and body in white structure. So as a result, uh, you can see again from the TB32 example, Audi A4 on the left, the older early NCAP vehicle amount. Look at the amount of damage, uh, uh, damage sustained by the vehicle deformation and look at the modern counterpart. So then the question becomes, if the vehicle is absorbing a lot more of the energy, what about the vehicle restraint system? Then that means vehicle restraint system is absorbing less of the energy. If the vehicle absorbs less of the deformation, uh, energy through deformation, then vehicle restraint system needs to absorb more of the energy. So then the question becomes, if we tested these systems with older vehicles, and now in the, in the real world, more rigid vehicles hit them, what happens? Uh, another big change is the introduction of SUVs. Now this, uh, uh, this graph from, uh, ACR shows the new passenger car registrations by segment in the EU in the last 20 years, and the orange bars show the SUVs, percentage of SUVs sold, and look at the year increase, almost half of all the cars sold now are SUVs. Why is that relevant for vehicle restraint systems? Because SUVs in general are heavier than their regular counterparts, for example, Audi Q5, based on that A4 platform around 1.8 tons on average. X3 based on the three series platform, around 1.9 tons, so a significant increase in mass. And when you increase the mass, obviously you also increase the impact energy, which means more energy will need to be absorbed by the vehicle restraint system now. And also with the SUVs, you're talking about higher center of gravity, which means when they impact something, you're talking about higher overturning moments and increased risk of rollover. Now, uh, I highly recommend you check out a specific video on VTI Sweden's YouTube channel and see what happens when a modern SUV hits a typical uh, Swedish barrier. Uh, also, the biggest change, perhaps, of all is the overall increase in mass over the board. Now, this, uh, this graph from ICCT shows the uh, vehicle mass in running order by country in the last 20 years. If you look at the EU average, you can see we started around 1.27 tons early 2000s on average, and now we are around 1.48 tons, so around 210 kilograms increase. And I have to stress, this is the average, which means there is a lot more vehicles which are heavier about the average. And the problem gets worse when you get to, you know, wealthier countries like Norway, the average there is at the moment 1.96 tons. 
and if we uh, split this data by the vehicle segment, or have more perhaps more relevant for us, look at our TV32 test class uh, segment T, average 1.7 tons, and the TV11 1.2 tons, so quite a significant increase. Now this is where we are already. We have a problem, but uh, let's look at where we are going with the introduction of electric vehicles. Obviously, climate change, carbon reduction targets, and ban on sale of new petrol and diesel cars from 2035. Now, uh, if you look at this data from ACR for the last three years, uh, you can see the top four categories there are showing alternatively powered vehicles sold in Europe. And you can see year on year increase. But if you look at the latest data for the UK from SMMT, end of August, year to date, you can see 54% of all cars sold in this country by end of August were alternatively powered vehicles. Why is that relevant for us, uh, vehicle restraint systems? As you probably guessed, uh, these represent another step change in increase in mass because EVs in, and hybrids in general uh, are uh, heavier than their uh, conventional counterparts. As you can see from this graph, plug-in hybrid electric, we're talking about 1.9 tons, battery electric 1.7 tons, whereas the average gasoline engine around 1.3 tons. Quite a significant increase, but let's see a more, you know, more concrete example. Let's take that Opel Corsa Gen B we started with, which we still use in test today. That's at 850 kilograms, but a modern Corsa today could weigh on average around 1.1 tons. But if you look at the electric version of the same vehicle with the same chassis, now we're looking at around 1.5 tons, a 600 kilogram increase. And if you look at the TV32 vehicle, what we are using today, a BMW 3 Series without the ballast, around 1.4 tons. The current gen, on average, around 1.7 tons. And the EV version of the same chassis, over two tons, over 650 kilograms increase. That's a quite significant increase. And then we carrying on to the same platform, but this time on the SUV chassis, uh, the X3 around 1.9 tons. And then there is the battery electric version of that, which is around 2.2 tons. So as you can see, quite a significant increase in mass. And then there are also other considerations coming with electric vehicles, for example, Electric vehicles have lower center of mass because of the battery location. What does that mean? Does it mean these vehicles are more likely to go under post and rail type systems? We don't know. Uh, they don't have an engine in front. How does that affect the interaction with a barrier during a crash? We don't know. Battery fire, electrocution risk, are they actual risks or are they uh, or represented? We don't know because we don't test with these vehicles. We test with old vehicles from 1990s. So before I finish, this is probably the most important slide in the whole presentation, sustainability versus safety. Look, on the left, you have an original DRS, tested to the current standard. Okay, you can go to the market with it. But what are the market drivers for these type of systems at the moment? Lower cost, lower emission, right? Uh, because people are competing with others and there's always more pressure to reduce the emissions. How can you achieve this? Just to oversimplify, the easiest way, you use less material, you have lower cost, lower emissions. And this is what the market is pushing at the moment, the manufacturers of these products. Whereas on the other hand, if you want to increase the containment capacity of the system, generally speaking, one way of achieving that is to increase the amount of material that goes into the system, but that increases the cost and uh, emissions. So as you can see, there is a problem there. The, the manufacturers are almost being pushed to iteratively crash test until they find the system which passes the test with the desirable results. But at the same time, we are not addressing the change in the vehicle fleet. So in a sense, the standard landscape at the moment pushing uh, these people uh, or maybe blocking the progress for innovation. So my final slide, just to conclude, let's be honest, a VRS definitely helps save countless lives, even today, every day, they're saving countless lives. Uh, but we are definitely not fit for the future. Impact test standards need an urgent update, but if we are realistic with the current uh, pace of things, revision of the N1317 could take another five to 10 years at least, no one can say for sure at the moment. So we're talking about potentially long-term problems because a system, a steel system you install on the road today, uh, realistically gonna stay there for another 25 years, a concrete system, 50 years. So. While these systems stay there, the, the fleet is going to continuously change and change. So then the question becomes, can we afford to wait for these standards to change, change? Or 
should we start developing a Euro NCAP style voluntary test program, like a kite mark, for example, where we create some kind of impact test for electric vehicles? So we give a way for these manufacturers to be able to develop these systems for the future. Uh, so I'm going to end on this quote, change, change before you have to, before it's too late. Uh, thank you. I will hand back to Nick now. Thank you, Cheki. That was fantastic. Um, as you say, you know, vehicle restraint systems, incredibly important function in terms of road safety. And, uh, you know, it's important that they are fit for purpose. Um, and I think your presentation highlights the need to ensure that the standards that underpin uh, not only the testing of our vehicles, but the road infrastructure needs to maintain pace with the changing vehicles, given issues around mass and weight distribution. So, you know, it, it may be that we need to look at what, what BSI and, uh, can do to support um, that domestically through the development of national standards alongside the European standards, perhaps. So there's a lot, a lot to unpack there. Um, moving on in the interest of time, and what I would say is we were due to finish at 3.30 this webinar, but what we may do is look to extend by 15 minutes or so to ensure we have time for questions. So hopefully uh, the majority of our attendees will be able to stay on a little bit longer. It'd be great if you could do that. So we've touched on the demands to our infrastructure from changing vehicles. Uh, our next speaker, who is Dr. Nick Reed, is going to spend some time talking about how the technologies inside and around our vehicles are changing, particularly the, the, the rise of uh, self-driving and, and automated driving systems and related technology. So how do we manage the introduction of self-driving and automated technologies into our vehicles and onto public roads? Nick is Chief Road Safety Advisor for National Highways and the founder of Reed Mobility, which is an independent research consultancy focused on the future of mobility. Um, in, in November 2021, it was report, appointed as um, National Highway's first ever Chief Road Safety Advisor, and he, his role there is providing review and challenge to the organisation in its aim to deliver Vision Zero across the strategic road network. It, on the topic of self-driving, Nick has also been very actively involved in the BSI standards programme around connected and automated mobility and directly involved in developing some of the operational standards and safety practices there. So you're really well placed to talk on the topic and the relationship with standards. Nick, over to you. Thanks very much, Nick. And yeah, I'm going to be talking about two pieces of work that uh, I've done for, for BSI. Uh, they really have emanated from um, an, an original piece of work to review all of the standards, all of the standards landscape as it applies to automated vehicles and identifying two particular gaps around safety assurance and around terminology. And so the follow-on work was to how, how could we fill those gaps? How can we um, start to introduce standardization into that safety assurance process and into the language that we use? And I just want to say as well, thank you very much to the, the preceding speakers, both with my Read Mobility and National Highways hats on very, very interesting presentations. Uh, yeah, lots of great content, including a picture of the car in which I passed my driving test, but I'll let you get, guess which of Chequi's images that was. Um, so I just wanted to start by comparing how humans drive as to how a self-driving vehicle will drive. So if we start on the left, um, a human uses their senses, their eyes, their ears, their touch, holding the steering wheel and their proprioception, that sense of movement to draw information about the world and, and how their, their driving is proceeding. Obviously the brain then processes that information making sense of it, integrating all of that sensory information from different modalities, combines that with knowledge of the rules of the road and, and the skills that the, uh, that the driver has, the, the, their objectives, the, where they want to go, how they want to get there. Um, and then also they, they introduce their understanding of the world. So being able to make predictions about what another driver might be about to do, what another road user might be able to do, whether that's a pedestrian, a cyclist, a horse rider, a motorcyclist. There is a, a mental model that they have that they can make predictions about the world. And then in response to that, the hands and the feet in particular uh, are responsible for applying actions to make the vehicle uh, change its behavior in response. So steer more left, steer more right, speed up, slow down, activate the lights, signal to others using the indicators or the horn. 
um, all of those um, senses are computed in the brain to convert it into actions by our, our hands and feet. Now, for on the self-driving side, it's a similar story, actually. You've got sensors in this case rather than senses. Those sensors might be camera, cameras, radars, lidars, ultrasound, microphones, all of which are gathering information about the outside world. They're doing it in a very different way to the way a human would, but that's how they are gathering information about um, the external environment. That is then, rather than a brain, that's going into computing technology to process that information. And then combined with uh, a computed knowledge of rules and, and driving skill um, and an understanding of the world. So that has to be either programmed you know, explicitly or learnt using a, a, an artificial intelligence, a deep learning process to understand the way the world works. And then based on that processing, the actions are converted into um, outputs to actuators on the vehicle. So again, steer more left, steer more right, speed up, slow down, signal to other road users. Now the hope, and the, some of the preceding speakers have touched on it, the hope is that um, by automating the driving task, we can reduce the likelihood of some of these factors that cause crashes today uh, when it comes to human driving. So distraction, inattention, fatigue, alcohol, drugs, the aging process and loss of um, sensory uh, capability there, and the simple errors that humans make over confidence and so on. Um, however, we need to be careful because we need to factor in the potential mistakes that robot drivers might make. There could be human errors in the programming. There could be hardware failures that we weren't anticipating. There could be bias in the data that's been used to train the, the automated vehicles to drive. And the driving environment is completely um, unpredictable. It is infinitely variable. Every drive is different. No two drives are the same. There might be some combination of factors that lead to um, safety critical incidents that we hadn't predicted. So we need to be careful over our safety assessment of self-driving vehicles. And the government has recognized this. So back in August 2022, they uh, produced a policy document that said uh, it was in response to the work of the Law Commission and it said the expected standard for self-driving vehicles should be that they should be behaving in a competent and careful manner and that noting that that is higher than that of the average driver. And even more recently than that, the Transport Select Committee has uh, responded to um, a, an inquiry on self-driving vehicles and they've deemed that competent and careful standard as being too weak and too vague. Now, this is really challenging because uh, I can understand it being called too vague because no one has a definition of what competent and careful means. The only thing we have is what competent and careful isn't, which is uh, court cases where a driver has been found guilty of falling below the standard of what is competent and careful. But there is no explicit understanding of what competent and careful means. But too weak is, is challenging because to drive at a competent and careful standard is already very high. And I can um, take you through what I mean by that. So uh, this is based on 2019 statistics, which is the, the, the data I had previously. I can, I can update that with the, the more recent uh, statistics. But uh, when preparing the presentation, this was the data I had available. So there were 1,752 fatalities in 2019 in Great Britain. And they were um, derived from 360 billion miles of um, travel. So if you divide the two numbers, you get approximately 200 million miles per fatality. So that's already a very high standard that we're expecting an automated vehicle to achieve, to go 200 million miles without being the cause of a fatal crash. But don't forget that that figure includes higher risk modes of travel, motorbikes, for example, and all of the crashes that were caused by uh, factors that an automated vehicle would never um, uh, encounter. So fatigued drivers, distracted drivers, intoxicated drivers, and so on. So if we take those out of the equation, we're now looking at cars only and fatalities where only the human error factor, where all the human error factors have been removed. We're looking at many, many fewer fatalities uh, uh, over a, a, a not dissimilar amount of driving. So we end up with 2 billion miles per fatality if we're um, comparing kind of apples and apples, undistracted, unimpaired, non-mistaken driver against the standard that we expect an automated vehicle to achieve. Now, you don't have to take my word from this. There's already been 
research from uh, the Rand Institute, which made a similar judgment around the number of miles that would need to be driven by an automated vehicle to, to get that statistical proof of safety. And they said hundreds of millions or even hundreds of billions of miles would, be, would need to be driven to prove their reliability in terms of uh, fatalities and serious injuries. And so if we had a, a fleet of 100 test vehicles and somehow we were able to get them to drive at 30 miles per hour for 24 hours a day, it would take us 33, over 33 million hours to cover that 100 billion miles. And again, we can do the maths, that's 1.4 million days or just about four millennia. So we need to think of other ways that we can demonstrate the safety of automated vehicles. And that's what uh, we've been working on uh, in the BSI program of research. Um, so we come up with this idea called digital commentary driving. I want to start with the idea of commentary driving, which is a process that is used for expert driver training and assessment, whereby the driver sits with a trainer or examiner and verbally describes the unfolding situation in front of him. And the examiner is looking to see, is the driver explaining all of the important um, items that they would expect a, a, a competent driver to notice and respond to as they proceed down the road. And they're, yeah, they're seeing, do they recognize all of the important factors and, and are they prioritizing them correctly? And then are they adapting their driving correctly in response? Now, digital commentary driving isn't the same thing. We're not expecting an automated vehicle to verbally describe what it's doing or what it's seeing. But what we are saying is there should be a standardized uh, approach to collecting data from an automated vehicle that gives you a sense of the items that it's seen and how it's going to respond to those items. And that's what we call digital commentary driving. It would be a, a relatively small data set. So we're not collecting video data. We're not connecting LIDAR point clouds or anything like that. It's simply the, uh, the, the kind of text-based data saying, how fast am I going? Where am I? What am I seeing? How am I going to change my uh, behavior and response? That's what we call digital commentary driving. And it seems reasonable to ask automated vehicle developers to um, be able to collect that data and submit it for analysis to demonstrate the safety of their vehicles. And uh, yeah, we're continuing to work on um, proving the value of digital commentary driving for self-driving vehicle safety. Now, the other piece of work I wanted to, to talk about was um, related to this importance of language. So when Ford released their Blue Cruise system earlier this year, they did a great job in uh, describing it very accurately. Now, what they couldn't help was how the media would then pick up on the technology that had been released. And uh, the Times uh, video still still online, if you, if you wanted to see it, um, their description of this Ford Blue Cruise system was that it was the UK's first self-driving car. Uh, and of course, this is a level two automated driving system. The driver needs to be uh, paying attention and ready to take over at any moment in time. Um, so it's not self-driving and, and it, this is potentially misleading. Um, and the, the video ends with, uh, on 2,500 miles of road in England, Scotland and Wales, once you're on the motorway, this car will completely drive itself. Well. Uh, it isn't first self-driving car and no, it won't drive um, for itself. It is a driver assistance system. So we, we need to be consistent and careful with our language because it can be safety critical. And that brings me to the, the work that we've done to create this CAM vocabulary. Uh, it's it's um, been delivered under the new BSI Flex standard. So it means we can um, generate and, and update this, um, uh, this document very rapidly but we don't lose any of the feedback from both industry and from public consultation in iterating this process. So we're now on to, to version five of the CAM vocabulary. There's over 100 terms and definitions in there. And it's, it's been a really enjoyable process to, to generate this, this vocabulary, um, ensure that when people use words like automated driving, we, are, we have a, a consistent, a shared understanding of what that really, really means. Uh, and can proceed on that basis. And government have, have embraced this standard in their competitions and, uh, and work around uh, automated driving. So just to, to, to close really, I wanna stress the importance of that speaking in a common language, whether it's around the data for assuring safety of self-driving vehicles, 
uh, or whether it's around our descriptions and our understanding of how these vehicles operate. I think it's important that we share common data. It shouldn't just be down to who's got the best marketing as to who is permitted to, to um, uh, deploy their vehicles on our streets. We should have clear and, and uh, evidence, uh, you know, strong data that shows us the vehicles will behave safely and that we can use that data to demonstrate competency both to, to regulators and to build trust with the public. And lastly, that we learn from our mistakes. So the work I've done with the public, they recognize that there still will be incidents involving self-driving cars, but it's really important that we can share data and learn from each other's mistakes so that we get to that optimal um, level of road safety, hopefully where Vision Zero can be achieved and self-driving vehicles can be a contributor to that. So yeah, it's been a great program to work on and I'm really looking forward to the discussions uh, subsequent to the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And as you say, communication is key uh, here. Self-driving is, is the great conundrum at the moment in terms of balancing that uh, the potential benefits of reducing driver error with the risks of ensuring the technology is safe for the public. And as you say, there's this need to be able to demonstrate that through the life, through the life of the vehicle in use to build that, that trust. Um, and the language we use is also important because if the industry isn't using the same language, we, we can't reasonably accept the media uh, to do the same. But that, that was a fantastic overview, Nick, and we'll, we'll, we've got a few questions on that topic, as, as you would probably expect. Our, our final speaker before we break into what may be a shorter Q&A session than we'd originally planned, but we will stay on a little bit longer, is uh, uh, Dr. Phil Martin of TRL. So Phil is Head of Transport Safety at uh, TRL. TRL is a not-for-profit distributing company specialising in transport research and consulting, and, and Phil leads TRL's transport safety work in the UK and globally. He has over 15 years' experience in applying safe systems approach to all transport sectors, um, and building safe, sustainable and resilient transport systems. Phil's also the co-lead of TRL's transport foresight team, gather intelligence and provide insights on the future of transport to their clients and to help uh, strategically prepare for, to help them prepare for uncertain futures. We've given Phil the, the challenge of trying to pull a lot of these different threads together for us and in terms of some of what we've heard today and and the links between standards and the safe system approach. So Phil's going to share some of his thoughts and insights uh, across that topic. Phil, we look forward to hearing more. Thank you, Nick. Yes, a, a very kind introduction there and, and a real pleasure to be able to uh, present to everyone today. Um, so yeah, as Nick said, um, I'll be bringing together all of the, the really interesting presentations that we've just seen today. Um, and provide a exploration uh, of the various challenges and opportunities for the use of standards um, when applied to the safe system approach. So we've, we've heard from Susie around the safe systems approach, what it is, why it's important, um, as well as uh, uh, some opportunities for improving the, um, the approach. We heard from Dave around ISO 39001 uh, as a framework for managing organizational road safety with some fantastic, um, uh, real life examples of of, of uh, that standard being implemented. Um, we also heard from Nick and Checky around um, emerging drivers of change, the the sort of social, techno uh, technological, and political challenges uh, being presented um, today to to um, to our in to our industry, uh, and how electric vehicles and autonomy may um, manifest in changes to the vehicle stop and the, the, the interactions of road users um, with vehicles on our roads. Um, and, and all of these challenges and opportunities really um, lead quite well into, into my presentation, really. So the SAFE system provides us with this structured mental model, which is you know, easy to understand, easy to action against, and it's you know, really valuable uh, for simply explaining uh, the need for various specialisms to work together in a coordinated and structured um, manner. And it creates areas of specialized knowledge under the different pillars, um, action and funding. And, and this is all, all really good. However, the SAFE system 
you know the reality is that a safe system is um is a complex system and, and road transport systems um are, are are really complex and you know here we have a a, a rather complex looking uh, control structure model um for introducing new technologies and this was for the australian road transport system uh, and this was created using a technique called um, systems theoretic accident um, model and processes or stamp for short uh, and what i really wanted to show here is that there are over 150 actors within this complex system all spread over two different control structures so we have the design and construction and, and operations control structures and six different hierarchical levels and, and all of these are covering um, the safe system pillars that we've been hearing about today. Now, I, I completely acknowledge that text is quite small uh, on this. So do take a look at the publication in your own uh, time for, for more detail. But what I really wanted to do is flag that the use of standards as a control mechanism appears multiple times throughout these, this, this control structure. Um, at different hierarch hierarchical levels with different um, actors you know, owning responsible for, for the development of um, standards. And I also wanted to um, and I also wanted to flag that um, so there are also several feedback mechanisms throughout this structure. Again, quite a few which would actually need some form of standardization to ensure you know, that an appropriate level of performance feedback is received through the system at the different hierarchy levels. And this really provides um, quite a challenge, uh, but, but also some opportunities for you know, future standards as well. So th this is ultimately the challenge. You know, how do we standardize a complex, dynamic, um, evolving socio-technical systems such as road safety with all its various interactions um, and dependencies on, on different parts of the systems, both from a hierarchy, both between hierarchies and within hierarchies, um, hierarchical levels. Um, and, and with the objective of reducing harm on our roads in, in you know, ultimately in a cost-efficient manner. Um, do we attempt to standardize constituent components of the system or, or do we try and address the system as a whole? Perhaps, you know, it's a mix of both, a hybrid of the two, um, but no doubt it's a challenge. To help sort of understand, there's a, there's a few sort of common challenges presented um, by uh, complex socio-technical systems. And, and, you know, what, one of the key ones is difficulty in determining the boundaries of the system. You know, most systems are are open um, and dynamic and, and can be influenced by externalities. Um, a really good example of this is the impact of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, in terms of temporary, temporarily relaxing uh, driver hour limits. And, and this had a knock-on effect on driver fatigue management and, and lots of other um, elements of, of road safety, particularly from a, a fleet operations perspective. Um, another another challenge is, is multiple feedback loops um, that are nested within the complex system, and these create uh, complex subsystem elements uh, within the system, you know, a, a system within a complex system. Um, and, and a good example of this is organizational systems within, in the, within the sort of wider transport systems, such as you know, the gig economy or, or where people are driving for business, uh, where, where you know, ultimately work-related um, road safety becomes a, a subsystem element that one is trying to control. Um, interactions between um, multiple constituent components also create you know, unintended or unpredictable uh, and quite often delayed consequences uh, for road safety. A good example of this is um, where improvements in vehicle crashworthiness over the last 20 or 30 years have been based upon the 50th percentile male crash test dummy. Uh, however, this has increased the risks uh, of certain injuries, such as abdominal injuries in particular, um, for female drivers, and where this risk has been delayed and, and um, recognition of this risk has been delayed. Um, 
There are also emerging and disruptive trends, um, and this this results in a need to establish, you know, new actors and new control and feedback mechanisms within such a system. And we've had two good examples of this today uh, in terms of the electric vehicles and vehicle automation um, presentations. And it's important to understand who has ownership of these um, various control uh, and feedback mechanisms. And, and by this, I mean, who is responsible and who's accountable um, for, for their, their implementation and, and their development. And this can be quite, you know, a, a quite often overlooked challenge. Uh, and this can result in gaps in ownership um, or duplication of ownership where two actors both want to claim ownership around a particular control or feedback mechanism. So ultimately, you know, understanding and, and, and addressing the challenges of these complex control mechanisms and, and feedback mechanisms uh, and, and understanding where standards fit into this is, you know, you know a fantastic op opportunity to, to, to really move the dial on road safety. So what, what is the current situation? Well, you know, not many standards address the safe system in its entirety. Um, you've heard today around uh, ISO 39001 and uh, ISO 39002. Um, and, and these consider the safe system approach based framework um, for organizations whose staff use the road network as part of their work or, or while commuting to work. However, you know, ultimately this is only focused on a nested subsystem within the wider and more complex transport system, you know, albeit it's an important one in regards to um, the contribution uh, of those collisions to, 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 um, to our, our um, uh, killed and seriously injured um, people using the road. We also have some good examples from construction, logistics and um, fleet operations sector um, through the clocks, uh, and fleet operation uh, operators recognition scheme standards. Um, Clocks considers control and, and feedback mechanisms that uh, that are available to multiple actors from right across the construction and, and logistics sector. And this includes regulators, local authorities, um, constructors and developers, principal contractors, fleet operators, um, vehicle manufacturers and community groups. Um, the purpose of the, the standard is to lay down requirements for uh, best practices and provide uh, an industry-wide standard um, to reduce harm by promoting safe, green and lean uh, vehicle journeys. And what's really important this, is that this is an example of, um, a, a, of quite a, a, a wide system that includes many actors from different levels of the hierarchy um, within um, within the the, the, the the transport system, FORS specifically focuses on operators, and there's a a lot of similarities and alignment in in some way with ISO 39001, um, and it's a voluntary uh, accreditation scheme um, that awards a fleet operator bronze, silver, or gold um, accreditation based upon how safe, efficient, and environmentally friendly they are uh, their operations are. One common theme of these standards are that they're sort of very clear about where the boundaries of their subsystem element lies, though, you know, whether it's fleet operations or, or the construction industry as a whole. What we can perhaps instantly recognize, however, is that at the component level, there are many, many standards um, right across the, the various safe system pillars. We have um, you know, safer vehicles uh, standards. That includes things like general safety regulation. We have protocols for Euro NCAP testing. We have safety of the intended functionality ISO standards with um, you know, the world leading bus safety standards from, from TFL and the direct vision standards as well from TFL. Um, you know, all good examples of where vehicle safety um, is being advanced. We also have um, standards around uh, improvements to, to, to safe road use and safe behaviors on roads. These include you know, the national standard for uh, driver and rider training. We have the 
PPE standards around motorcycle helmet and testing protocols for, for uh, improving the safety of motorcycle helmets and, and other PPE. Um, we have um, we have uh, standards for um, the speed of, of vehicles through through roadworks. Um, we have standards around the um, the sp speed enforcement and management systems um, and and their their reliability and and their effectiveness. We have a whole raft of um, highways um, standards. Uh, design standards as well, um, both for highways and we also can have these for cycling infrastructure and, and for urban roads. We can have standards for post-crash care such as e-call um, systems uh, and also for um, uh, and also for forensic collision investigations and also for um, for for event data recorders, so there's a, there's a you know a raft of standards, um, and it may seem that like there's a lot on this slide, but in fact there's you know there's hundreds of standards regulations um, that lie within the design and construction control structures, and also within the operations control structures. Um, the, the key is really that, that these are only addressing addressing components of that safe system, and not the safe system as a whole. So we've in in the earlier presentations we've we've sort of um, we, we've touched on the fact that emerging trends can um, disrupt um, disrupt uh, the, the 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 system um, and this can create both opportunities and and risks um, and so you know from you know blockchain to, to AI you know the, the cost of living crisis to the aging population, um, cybersecurity to climate change, um, drug and drink driving to distracted driving. You know that there, there are emerging trends that are emerging almost on a monthly, weekly, daily basis, uh, and these all create disruption, all create risks and opportunities, um, which you know which can be addressed through standardisation. I'll just focus quickly on e-scooters as a as a recent emerging trend. Some may say it's not really emerging anymore, um, but you know, thinking about the safe systems applied to e-scooters, you know, we we have you know safe speeds, for example, uh, and that's the one that's really only controlled at the moment, um, and that's with the vehicles you know being speed and power limited, essentially. Um, we have um, Safe operations um, and safe. Uh, you know, we, we look when we look at safe management. Um, we have the we have we don't necessarily have um, safety management systems in place for the operation of these vehicles. Um, applying something like ISO uh, three thirty nine thousand and one, and and I think um, uh, would be really interesting to this sector um, when it comes to safe vehicles are there any requirements around minimum wheel size around audible warnings perhaps for these vehicles when it comes to safe roads and safe roads infrastructure you know what does safe infrastructure look like to an e-scooter ride to an e-scooter you know is is you know the uh, ltn 120 guidance for, for cycle infrastructure could that be used or, or does something specific need to be um, used for for e-scooters for safe users you know is there a standard um, that could be applied to um, safe um, safe handling training courses and post crash care you know it are you know is there a standard that can be applied to the data that would need to the minimum data set that would need to be um, that would need to be collected for event data recorders uh, and what about um, electric fires so what can we really do about this well um you know there's a real need to to provide you know to to scan the horizon um to prioritize emerging trends based upon the risks and opportunities um that they present uh, to the safety of the system and to take a real safe systems thinking uh, approach to 
introducing new control mechanisms, new feedback mechanisms, um, and doing that in a standardized manage, manner. So a, a final challenge to consider for, for standards is when is safe, safe enough? Um, so in the UK, the Health and Safety at Work Act um, states that employers should reduce risks as far so far as is um, reasonable, reasonably practicable. Um, so this term is um, often used interchangeably with with ALARP, so as low as reasonably practical. Practical. Uh, and although there are subtle differences between these two, the, the key principle is the same: reasonable practicable, practicability. Uh, and this is often defined as um, balancing the level of risk against the measures needed to control the real risk in terms of money, time, or trouble. Um, so this is a necessary balance in order to prevent you know, grossly disproportionate um, interventions, um, which sit outside of the available resources of, of a specific organization. Um, however, this, uh, this balance of cost against safety leads to challenges when we are trying to achieve a, uh, a transport system, uh, you know, a safe system, uh, that is free of death and serious injury. Um, ultimately, this is because at some point it becomes, uh, you know, no longer practicable to lower the risk further, meaning that there's some level of residual risk. And, and I think this has been explored quite well in in Nick's presentation earlier. Um, and and what this all means is that demonstrating um, reasonable practicability is is you know, not sufficient for guaranteeing zero deaths or, or zero serious injuries on our road. And thus it sort of fails to align with the vision, you know, with the, the vision zero ambitions of the safe systems approach. Um, it, it should also be considered that, you know, generally speaking, that is, uh, you know, budget for, for safety is most likely based upon the resources that were and are required to achieve um, currently accepted levels of risk. And this leads to a situation where sort of pre-agreed budgets for, for two, three, four years are actually determining what is reasonably practicable, um, which ultimately leads to a situation where safety improvements stagnate around previously to tolerable limits. And, and that leads to the questions, you know, it, it is 1,700 fatalities for the past sort of five to 10 years on Great Britain's roads really good enough? And, and are we stagnating? Uh, and Susie, you touched on that really nicely earlier. So what, what can we do about it? Well, ultimately to, to achieve the vision zero ambitions of the safe systems, we have to consider two key actions, the introduction of progressive standards, importantly, that, that iteratively continue to push at the envelope of good enough uh, and proactive risk management approaches that consist of, consider the, you know, the, the system as a whole to identify and manage the risks of harm before it rises. Uh, just some final reflections really that, you know, to sort of summarize, you know, this, the safe system is a complex system um, that consists of many interacting actors and, and control and feedback mechanisms. And, and standardizing within such a complex system is, is a real challenge, but it also presents quite a few opportunities to, to, to make a difference and, and really shift the dial on road safety. There aren't very many standards that, that currently address the safe system in its entirety, and, and we've heard of some today that do a great job at that. Um, and there is a proliferation of, of standards that address individual components within the safe system and, and all doing a great job, but, but really restricted in, 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 in their focus and, and maybe not understanding how they interact with the rest of the system. Um, and you know, our ultimate ambition to achieve vision zero as through the safe system approach, um, to achieve that, we need to introduce progressive standards that really push at the envelope of, of, of safety and proactive risk management processes that consider the whole system. 
And I think that's all for me. Thanks, Nick. Over to you. Thanks, Phil, and really appreciate you helping to, to pull together threads of what is a very complex uh, topic for us and some great points in there. I particularly feel, you know, the, the point around road safety needing to be equitable and, and not discriminating is a, is a key one. It feels like there's, from what you've said, lots of opportunities to consider how we align standards to safe systems, but there also perhaps needs to be a rationalisation of the standards that exist and um, you know, and looking at how they align to say systems in in a in a more uh, useful way. And thank thanks also for sharing those links to existing research guidance and and standards. That's very helpful. I, I'd like to ask um, our other panelists um, to turn on their cameras, please. Um, feels like a long time ago we heard from Susie. Now <laughs> it's always a always going to be an ambitious agenda. Um, and uh, we are slightly overrunning, so it's going to be a, a, quite an edited um, Q&A session. But we've got some really interesting questions that have come in. We may have lost Susie, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll push them out to our speakers and um, we'll get through a number of questions and then we'll aim to still wrap up by um, four o'clock. So uh, what, what I might start with, and this probably would have been a great uh, question to bring Susie in on as well, but as as our panelists would probably expect we've had a, a lot of questions around the 20 mile an hour zones um and there's a kind of balance between people that feel this is a, is a good move for road safety and others that are uncertain about the reliability of it as uh, in terms of uh, 20 mile an hour zones as a measure what data sits behind that Susie touched upon that a little bit in her presentation um, so I'm just wondering, I don't know, perhaps Nick and Phil, this is one to, to get your thoughts are on just generally your reflections on the 20 mile an hour speed limits and some of the, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the non-political um, aspects of that in terms of the effectiveness of the measure and, and the research that shows that these um, low speed zones can be effective. Is there, is there any thoughts you'd be happy to share with, with the audience on that? Yeah, for, from my side, I th the evidence is, is pretty good that 20 mile per hour speed limits are effective in reducing uh, KSIs. Um, and, and actually, I, I know these, these political debates can get quite heated, but I actually don't think there's too far between the positions. I think it's about just selecting the environments at w in, in which it's best to use a 20 mile per hour speed limit. And you know, again, language is really important here. So it maybe it isn't a blanket 20 mile per hour limit, it's a default 20 mile per hour speed limit. And in Wales, you know, there is um, the ability for local authorities to, to vary that up in for, for roads where they feel retaining 30 miles per hour is appropriate. So, so yeah, I think actually, um, although there's a lot of heat, maybe not too much light from the, the political side of things and actually just choosing the right speed for the environment and you know, we had um, Susie's presentation on the IRAP protocol, and that gives a lot of insight into where, uh, what speeds are appropriate given the infrastructure and the users of that particular road. I think that gives us a lot more um, uh, evidence to decide on what's an appropriate speed. You're on mute there, Nick. Phil, did you, did you want to come in on, on that? Yeah, one? yeah. yeah I, I think, Nick, you've covered it really well there um and i think i think also susie's presentation did a really good job at that as well and and for me it you know it, it ultimately comes down to using the right road speeds in the right environments um and that what the right environment is is a combination of of the the the, the types of movement and, and the types of place that uh you know the, the place and the movement um function that Susie showed in her presentation, where we have, you know, city hubs and city streets with local streets and movement corridors, as 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 um, as as is in her presentation. All of these have uh, have a, a speed that is appropriate for that place, um, a road speed that's appropriate for those places, uh, and and that's the key, really, that that the right speed. At the right place. What, what one of the 
one of the things that Susie touched on earlier and, and others did is you know road safety has improved generally over the last 30 40 years but but there's this slight stagnation or plateau and I'm just interested in whether our panelists feel that you know what what's the solution there is is are we looking at you know the 20 mile an hour zones or to, to try and move the needle on where we currently are in terms of fatalities and collisions I, I can kick, kick off again. I, I think it's the application of the safe system, Nick. And we look at in each pillar, each category of the safe system, and see what are the tools available to us um, to to get us back on track to get that um, those fatalities decreasing again. I think self-driving is going to be part of the the solution, but it's not everything, and it's not happening as quickly as as we might have expected five years ago. So we need to look to other aspects of the safe system to help get us back on that descending trajectory. Um, certainly, you know, Checky's work on barriers could be a, a real significant contributor. IRAP and the understanding of uh, road environments, training, uh, policies, you know, the, the road safety management that Dave talked about. I think you know, we have to look at improvements in all of these areas and this kind of um, the marginal gains theory, isn't it? We look at yes. everywhere where we can improve and gradually, slowly but surely, we'll have to prevent uh, the, all the casualties we see on the roads today. Thank you, Nick. And, and Dave, I'd like to bring you in there if I can. Um, interested in, in your perspective there and you know, also based on your, your fantastic presentation earlier and quite a few questions in around ISO 39001 and how that applies to the strategic road network and, and also the potential for the standard to be used alongside other standards in the in the kind of quality management series, including occupational health and safety. So, uh, if you're able to pick up some of those broader questions as well, Dave, that would be helpful. <laughs> my best. That was quite a long question. I don't know if my answer's <laughs> that long. Um, I think the first thing I would say on speed limits, the 20 speed limit, um, perhaps just a converse view, because I, I like to play devil's advocate sometimes, and that, that view is we have a speed limit of 20 mile an hour because it proves protects um, innocent people, protect um, you know, pedestrians, vulnerable road users from the effects of the 20 mile, of, you know, the impact with the vehicle. But that's like, that's the only solution. There are a whole host of other ways that we can protect the vulnerable user from the vehicle, such as segregated pathways, safe walking routes, et cetera, et cetera, and they seem to get disregarded. Uh, you know, if you take the view of the only workable solution is to make the car go slower, why don't we make the car go 10 mile an hour where it does even less damage? I think we need to take a much wider view on what is the appropriate speed and what is the best way of preventing the injury. And it's not necessarily about speed because we run the risk of going back into the stone age if we all end up just pushing our cars around. Uh, the other thing, and I think this is the important thing when you ask the question about how do we get UK Limited or UK PLC back on the track of reducing accidents is the same fundamental thing that is the first clause in every management system standard, and that is leadership. And we need a country that is led by people who actually care about the increasing toll of lives and injuries that we have on our roads. And as long as we as a country appoint ministers into roles because they're a mate of the guy who was standing for election rather than because of their specific individual skills and talents and knowledge and expertise, then we run the risk of, of just being leaderless. And that's where I feel the UK has been for the past 10 years or more. And we can set ourselves objectives for reducing emissions and reducing carbon and so on. But no one anywhere seems to be setting a meaningful limit to the number of people we allow ourselves to kill each year on the roads. Dave, Dave something you touched upon there. Sorry, Phil, I was just going to bring you in a little bit on the the segregation as well and some of those other measures thinking about as we drive towards sustainability decarbonization modal shift will happen we're seeing an increase in active travel and we want to increase active travel routes and micro mobility is part of that but yeah i was interested in your thoughts phil on that as well if, if possible 
Yeah, I'll 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 start off with because um, I really wanted to come in on on Dave's point there um, around leadership. So there's leadership of the country, which you know obviously you know is is really important, but there's also leadership at all the different levels of all the different hierarchical levels within the control systems that we have. So it's not just leaders of the country, but it's leaders uh, of our you know of of operators. It's leaders of um, you know our highways authorities and our local authorities. There has to be leadership across the system, um, and that's really important um, because without that leadership in all the different, uh, for, amongst all the different actors, uh, that we don't get that consistency of message, and we don't we don't get that reduction of harm across the system, uh, and that can push harm from one part of the system to another part of the system as well, um, if we're not getting that uh, that leadership. Um, and 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 actually getting that all to happen at the same time is a real challenge and, and one that one that I quite like is is that you get sort of vehicle standard vehicle um, type approval regulations and we've just had a, a massive leap forward in, in those with the general safety regulation um, and that but that doesn't necessarily happen at the same time as improvements across the other pillars um, and actually the to to reduce harm that system has to grow has to improve all at the same time as well and that's really critical to to uh, reducing harm you otherwise you push um you push the the risk of harm from one part of the system to another thanks phil uh, really helpful insights so checky I'd, I'd like to um direct a question your way if i may which is a question that's quite specific to your presentation um, around the testing requirements for vehicle restraint systems and you, you touched upon this a little bit in your talk but there was a question around um, you know will the testing requirements be reviewed or, or updated to reflect the increased volume of electric vehicles um, so is there anything we can say on that today in terms of where we are on that journey in addition to what you've covered already well, I can say it needs to change. That's for certain. When is it, when is it going to change? Is a whole different thing because you have to understand these standards, European standards, are almost like steering a tanker. There is a lot of people, a lot of manufacturers spend huge sums of money. Uh, road authorities spend huge sums of money developing the existing systems, and they have a lot of say in the development of these standards. Now, even manufacturers, road authorities, test houses, they recognize this problem, but. To change the standard, you need to agree on common properties of these things on a massive scale. It takes a, a long time. So uh, people talk about this. Well, this is why I'm here, to raise the awareness, try to push it forwards a bit faster. But honestly, at the moment, I can't give you an exact date. This is why I was saying maybe we should start exploring voluntary uh, testing standards, like, for example, when motorcyclist protection system additions for the barriers uh, they are being tested as an in-house test method developed in some of the Euro European test houses and after a while because that was the only test method out there people started adopting that and became a European specification so someone needs to start somewhere to give these people you know manufacturers a way of actually showing but that's not where it ends the next stage is let's say we have a standard for people to test these uh, vehicles with, with barriers with these vehicles assuming they are a bit more expensive how are they, how are they going to compete with cheaper mm -hmm. barriers then uh, you need the road authorities to step in and say look i need to be able to specify this uh, system which is compatible with uh, today's uh, vehicles not the cheapest or just the lowest carbon emitting one you need to give the tools to the right people to enable the innovation at the moment some of it is there some of it is not there our job, I guess, is to find ways of accelerating that, because I don't think we can wait. No, that, that's that's helpful, and you know, I'd I'd really like this to be a topic that the BSI looks at in terms of is there an opportunity for us to develop some domestic standards to, um, you know, in parallel or alongside the European standards to, um, to support this issue. We've had a, a few questions, Checky, around yeah, electric vehicles and infrastructure. One of one of the questions was asked around, um, you know, adapting rural road structures for EVs. 
I'm just interested, is that a topic that's come in, into your area of work at all, looking at this from an infrastructure perspective? Not, not in that specific area. All I can say is usually single carriageways are higher risk for roadside safety than motorways. That's for certain. But just a slightly different subject, I want to clarify something. I'm not sure it came across clear in my presentation. I wasn't trying to say that vehicle restraint systems today aren't working, they're not saving lives. They're saving lives on a daily basis. If you look on the road, you will see lots of barriers that were damaged, but they are not captured in the standards because, sorry, statistics, because there was no injury. What I'm trying to say is, with this current uh, direction, we will start seeing more and more systems being uh, you know, filtered out and not working. So what we have taken for granted is going to progressively start becoming a problem potentially. And uh, yeah. So this is kind of future-proofing future -proofing exactly. the infrastructure, really. Because yeah. it's a huge problem to solve in a very short time, a massive cost we're talking about if you want to solve it tomorrow. Thanks. No, that's great. Uh, one, one of you know, one of the challenges of talking such a, a, a broad area of, of, of road safety management is, you know, we dance from one topic to the next. But quite a few questions have come in around, um, I guess, the, the the kind of lines between ADAS and, and self-driving. Um, and Nick, uh, Dave in particular, you might ha have a view on this. But I guess the general gist of most of the questions is around. Hey, the, the potential for, for this technology to prevent collisions. Um, and there's also a couple of interesting questions around whether, you know, the, these new features could actually make our roads less safe. Um, but, but also um, an interesting question around, you know, whether drivers uh, actually understand how to use their in-car safety features now, let alone if they were, you know, we had the potential for level three autonomy um you know do drivers switch these features off so um i don't know uh nick perhaps i can push that out to you but perhaps starting with this uh question around um you know do, do we think this uh, is there evidence to show that this technology could prevent collisions at a significant rate yeah, definitely this, i get from the self-driving side we don't have enough data yet to be able to show that the um the manufacturers waymo crews are starting to produce their own materials to indicate that they believe the the where they have deployed fully self-driving vehicles they are operating at a level that is safer than human driving there are questions around that you know are they being fully transparent over the, the data yeah questions to answer um but it's good to see at least that they are focusing more on proving the safety of their technology. Um, on the kind of ADAS and, and driver support side, I'm a human factors person by background, and it's, it's always one of the last things people think about when they're developing an engineering system, is I can make this technology work, now how do I make it work for people? Um, when really making it work for people should be where you start uh, and then develop the technology around it. So um, yeah, there's, there's always more work that could be done around the, the human factors side. And making sure uh, the process by which people get to learn how to use these systems uh, is, is effective and that when they do use them they they use them in such a way that they provide a, a tangible and enjoyable benefit because if they don't enjoy using them they'll turn them off and we won't get that benefit that we've all spent so much money and effort developing yeah that, that's helpful and uh, yeah as you say that one of the questions was well, it was more of a suggestion that, you know, what might we find a future where you can't actually turn those features off? Um, you know, is that is that creating its own challenges? Um, Dave, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, given the work you've been doing around the ethical considerations more broadly. Well, um, there, there's several aspects. I mean, the first is that without a shadow of a doubt, the best drive raids are the ones that are totally automatic and, and can hardly be disabled anyway, such things as ABS or autonomous emergency braking. They're the really good ones. They'll just, just happen whether you want them to happen or not. Things like uh, lane keep control or automatic lane control, they're ones that people are perhaps a little more inclined to turn off and, uh, and so on 
Uh, I've got automatic lane control on my car and I've tried it a few times and I must admit it does leave me somewhat uncomfortable uh, because it doesn't always agree with me as to where we should be positioned within the lane. Uh, so that tends to put people off, especially if you come off a motorway and you don't turn off the automatic lane control and at the top of the slip road is a roundabout because automatic lane control and roundabouts really don't get on. Um, uh, and again, in, in terms of the sort of management system and the right way to behave, a lot of it is about the training. Uh, and at the moment, I think there are a lot of people developing some good training for drivers around some of these systems. Certainly, we are now seeing courses and toolbox talks for driving electric vehicles, um, because undoubtedly there is a different approach to driving electric vehicles, particularly when you think about acceleration and so on the acceleration on an electric car is astonishing really so i think hopefully that answered that part of the question was out there about autonomous vehicles the autonomous vehicles thing was a very interesting one because i always have the concern and still do that at, at the end of the day if the car is programmed to behave dare i say irresponsibly um then that's the way it will behave. And, and, and if I go back some six years ago now, I had to produce a document to justify the work in ISO on ethical conditions or ethical standards for autonomous vehicles. And one of the comments I made was what would stop the manufacturer of an autonomous vehicle deliberately designing it to do 10% above the speed limit and therefore claiming it was the fastest autonomous vehicle on the road because it was going the absolute maximum it could get away with. And then, yeah, it was meant partly as a joke. And I was somewhat shocked to find two or three years later that a certain manufacturer of a car that claims to have autonomous qualities has actually designed it in sport mode to do 10% above the speed limit deliberately. And you know, these are the sort of issues you've actually got to look at with autonomous vehicles, you know, and it's all very well to say, yeah, they'll have LIDAR and they'll have radar and so on. But at the end of the day, you've got to be very mindful of the sort of ethical decisions the thing is going to make along its route. Thanks, Dave. I mean, autonomy and self-driving is probably a topic we could discuss on its own for an, an entire day. And um, yeah. we've covered a lot of ground today, and I'm mindful that we've kept uh, our panelists, our speakers, and our audience on for half an hour longer than we originally said we would. So big thanks for that. Um, we've managed to keep over 250 of you on until four o'clock, so that's fantastic. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers, including Susie, who's, who's had to step away for their time and fantastic presentations. And also, thank you for joining um, uh, this session. We hope it will be the first of, of more road safety um, themed uh, conferences and webinars. I think there's a big topic here and we might go forward and bite it off into smaller chunks next time. For those of you who asked questions, and there's lots of questions we didn't get to, we will see if we can come back to some of those questions. Some of them are specific technical questions. Some of them are directed towards individual speakers. And we'll, we'll speak to our, uh, our panelists to see if we can respond to any of those outside of the webinar. Um, so I'm going to pass back to Dawn now, who's going to close the session for us. Thanks for bearing with us the extra time. Um, and yeah, you, your, your attendance is much appreciated. Thank you and uh, good to see everyone. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Nick. Um, yeah, so I've just included on this slide, um, and also we've posted in the chat the, the link so you can access directly. So it's just signposting for more information. So we do have a, a national committee, and um, that's so if you're interested in kind of influencing and shaping the standards, then please do get in touch and, and find out about how you can join. Um, I've also included a link to the CAB program that Nick mentioned earlier in his presentation. Um, and you can sign up uh, for a free trial to access our complete library of standards as well by our, via our BSI knowledge platform. So um, the links are in the chat and then we'll also circulate the slides after the, the session as well along with the recording. So um, yeah, that's it. that's it from us. So thank you so much for joining and, and for staying on until the end. Thank you. 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 Thank you.